Hey, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for welcoming, uh, joining us. Uh, today we're going to be doing something uh, in your notes, so grab your packet. We'll talk about evolution and some evidence for it. Please check your uh, Schoology. Make sure you're all caught up on the assignments and things. So we're checking. Okay, we're going to be doing a uh, little evidence. Hey, why don't you check this out, and let's find out what evolution is anyway. The Five Fingers of Evolution A thorough understanding of biology requires a thorough understanding of the process of evolution. Most people are familiar with the process of natural selection, however, this is just one of five processes that can result in evolution. Before we discuss all five of these processes, we should define evolution. Evolution is simply change in the gene pool over time. But what is a gene pool? And, for that matter, what is a gene? Before spending any more time on genetics, let us begin with a story. Imagine that a boat capsizes and 10 survivors swim to shore on a deserted island. They are never rescued and they form a new population that exists for thousands of years. Strangely enough, five of the survivors have red hair. Red hair is created when a person inherits two copies of the red gene from their parents. If you only have one copy of the gene, you won't have red hair. To make this easier, we will assume that the five non-redheads are not carriers of the gene. The initial frequency of the red hair gene is therefore 50%, or 10 of 20 total genes. These genes are the gene pool. The 20 different genes are like cards in a deck that keep getting reshuffled with each new generation. Sex is simply a reshuffling of the genetic deck. The cards are reshuffled and passed to the next generation. The deck remains the same, 50% red. The genes are reshuffled and passed to the next generation. The gene pool remains the same, 50% red. Even though the population may grow in size over time, the frequency should stay at about 50%. If this frequency ever varies, then evolution has occurred. Evolution is simply change in the gene pool over time. Think about it in terms of the cards. If the frequency of the cards in the deck ever changes, evolution has occurred. There are five processes that can cause the frequency to change. To remember these processes, we will use the fingers on your hand, starting from the little finger and moving to the thumb. The little finger should remind you that the population can shrink. If the population shrinks, then chance can take over. For example, if only four individuals survive an epidemic, then their genes will represent the new gene pool. The next finger is the ring finger. This finger should remind you of mating because a ring represents a couple. If individuals choose a mate based on their appearance or location, the frequency may change. If redheaded individuals only mate with redheaded individuals, they could eventually form a new population. If no one ever mates with redheaded individuals, these genes could decrease. The next finger is the middle finger. The M in the middle finger should remind you of the M in the word mutation. If a new gene is added through mutation, it can affect the frequency. Imagine a gene mutation creates a new color of hair. This would obviously change the frequency in the gene pool. The pointer finger should remind you of movement. If new individuals flow into an area or immigrate, the frequency will change. If individuals flow out of an area or emigrate, then the frequency will change. In science, we refer to this movement as gene flow. All four of the processes represented by our fingers can cause evolution. Small population size, non-random mating, mutations, and gene flow. However, none of them lead to adaptation. Natural selection is the only process that creates organisms better adapted to their local environment. I use the thumb to remember this process. Nature votes thumbs up for adaptations that will do well in their environment and thumbs down to adaptations that will do poorly. The genes for individuals that are not adapted for their environment will gradually be replaced by those that are better adapted. Red hair is an example of one of these adaptations. Red hair is an advantage in the northern climates because the fair skin allowed ancestors to absorb more light and synthesize more vitamin D. Thumbs up. However, this was a disadvantage in the more southern climates where increased UV radiation led to cancer and decreased fertility. Thumbs down. Even the thumb itself is an adaptation form through the process of natural selection. 
The evolution that we have described is referred to as microevolution because it refers to a small change. However, this form of evolution may eventually lead to macroevolution or speciation. Every organism on the planet shares ancestry with a single common ancestor. All living organisms on the planet are connected back in time through the process of evolution. Take a look at your own hand. It's an engineering masterpiece that was created by the five processes I just described over millions and millions of years. Can you recall the five main causes of evolution from memory? If you can't, hit rewind and watch that part again. But if you can, give yourself or your neighbor a big five-fingered high five. So now we know, now we know what evolution is all about. Um, how do we know that it's happening? How do we prove it? That's what today's all about, the evidence for evolution. So go ahead and take out your packets if you have them, and let's fill out some of our basic notes so we don't forget the proof that we have for evolution being a thing. Number one, can we go back into time and check out things that lived in the past? No. Of course we can't. Yes, we can. Fossils. Fossils show us the remains of organisms that have been trapped in rock, specifically sedimentary rock. Fossils can be found in layers, and since la rock layers tend to um, lay down one upon the other, that means the deeper the layer, the older the fossils. And fossils can be dated using different methods and comparisons to other fossils to find out when the organism lived on Earth, what the environment might have been like, what other creatures lived at the same time. And we might be able to tell a lot about life in the past. So pause if you need to. What kind of creature do you think this was? This looks like a fossil of some sort of insect. I see the body, maybe a wing here, and several leg parts. So insects like this today, like cicadas, are still alive. How is this one different than the ones that lived at this time? Now, if you're interested in how fossils formed, you can check out the video um, right here, and I will post these in the video links as well. You found a fossil? Hey, why are you digging a hole in the backyard? I don't think that's a fossil. I think it belongs to the Rottweiler next door. <laughs> Dear Tim and Moby, What makes something a fossil? From Ross. Well, a fossil is a remnant of an organism. Usually, fossils are at least several thousand years old and found in the ground. Not every organism gets fossilized after it dies. As a matter of fact, it's a pretty rare occurrence. Fossilization has to start off with the right circumstances, like a quick burial. This is a body fossil, a part of the original organism that's been preserved. It's a bug that got trapped in amber, a type of sticky tree sap. Over time, the sap hardened, and we were left with this little keepsake. Body fossils are usually found in places where bacteria, insects, and the other things that cause decay aren't able to thrive. They form when an animal dies in the desert, or gets frozen in ice, or, I don't know, gets trapped in a tar pit. Yeah, well, body fossils are really rare. Trace fossils, like these footprints, are the most common fossil type. Trace fossils can include animal tracks, nests, bite marks, even animal poop. Other types of fossils form when an animal dies and is immediately covered by earth, mud, or sand. The covering slows decay down to a crawl and eventually turns to solid rock. The hardest parts of the animal, stuff like bones, teeth, and shells, don't decay for thousands of years. When they finally do, they've left a lasting impression in the rock. That's a mold fossil, a hollow print. Sometimes, water will bubble up through the earth, filling a mold with minerals. Over time, the minerals harden into rock, leaving a cast fossil. A cast fossil looks just like the original bone or shell. Right, of course, there are also carbon-based fossil fuels. All of the oil, gas, and coal on Earth was formed from the remains of fossilized plants and animals. For example, way, way, way back, like 300 million years ago, much of the planet was covered by tropical swamps. When the trees and plants that lived there died, they drifted to the bottom of the swamp. There, they slowly decomposed and formed a soggy, spongy substance called peat. 
Eventually, the peat got buried under layers of dirt and rock. Heat and pressure took their toll, and after millions of years, the peat turned into coal. Anyway, we can learn a lot from fossils. By looking closely at the fossil record, we can discover when and where lots of different organisms lived. In fact, we can learn about the entire history of life on Earth. Oh, the fossil record is just a fancy term for the sum total of what we know about fossils. Yeah, that's not going to work. It has to be under extreme pressure for millions of... Huh. And so, uh, our second thing we're going to look at is anatomy, which is body structures and parts of living things that we can compare looking for relationships. Homologous structures, similar structures, like the forelimbs of these different animals, can show some evolutionary relationships. Pause if you need to. Let's take a look at some creatures that have some homologous structures, like this dog, seal, bat, and bird. In the forelimb, we see this blue bone located in each of these species, even though they're quite different. These show, and even in humans, that there's some similarities to the underlying anatomy of these creatures, even though a leg and a flipper and a wing are quite different. Now, birds are the most different of the the species here. So they're going to have probably the most unique body structures. But even in, in some of the others, we saw some fingers. Okay, number three, embryology. Study of the embryos. That means unborn offspring of different species, trying to look at some similarities and comparisons. And you look back at some of the youngest, that first row, um, of these embryos, it's hard to tell what's going to be what. The middle row is a little older, and then finally the last row. Humans are the far right. And now our fourth and most maybe modernist, most modern way of looking at uh, these evolutionary relationships is DNA analysis through the discovery of genetics and genes and being able to extract and compare the code. We can compare the proteins and genes of different living species to show the relationship genetically which can form some very interesting connections because we now know that uh, you, humans, and bananas share about 50% of the same genes, share about 99% of the same genes as a chimpanzee, and you share 99.999% uh, same genes as anyone else on the human race and the human uh, you know, species, homo sapiens. So. You know, let's get along, people, because we're, we're all like the same. All right. Um, so DNA, embryology, anatomy, and the fossil record are four really nice, strong pieces of evidence that show how things have changed gen genetically with the gene pool has changed over time. All right. So let's look at a claim. All living things are related, like this whole family tree. And let's talk about how we can prove that, okay? So I want you to watch how we prove that, and then um, we'll wrap this up. So thank you so much for joining us today. Let's check this out. The theory of biological evolution makes two very bold claims about living creatures. First, all living things on Earth are related. They evolved from a common ancestor. Second, the evolution of living things is powered by natural processes things which can be studied and understood. Mm, mm, mm. But is there really any evidence that these two claims are true? Yeah. Yes. There are so many observable facts from so many different fields of study that the only way we can even begin to talk about them is to group them into categories or lines of evidence. To keep things simple, here we'll focus on evolution's first claim that all living things on Earth are related. We cannot tackle the entire tree of life at once. After all, there's an estimated 8.7 million species alive today. So instead, we'll focus most of our attention on one fairly small but fascinating branch of the evolutionary tree, cetaceans. This branch includes whales, dolphins, and porpoises. Biologists tell us that all these creatures are closely related and that the entire group evolved from an ancient four-legged land mammal. 
Instead of taking their word for it, let's look at the facts. We'll start by looking at a few from the field of comparative anatomy, the study of differences and similarities between living things. Whales live in water, and from a distance, they sort of look like giant fish. A close inspection of their anatomy, however, tells us a very different story. Whales, just like land mammals but unlike fish, have placentas and give live birth. They feed milk to their young. They are warm-blooded, which is extremely rare for a fish. And whales do not have gills. Instead, just like us, they breathe air with two fully developed lungs. Whales don't seem to have noses like mammals do. Instead, they breathe through blowholes coming out the tops of their heads. Some whales have two blowholes which almost look like nostrils, but dolphins and porpoises only have one. Surprisingly, if you look at their skulls, you find that the blowhole splits into two nasal passages inside the head. Could it be that the blowhole is actually a highly modified mammal nose? It looks that way, but we'll need more evidence to be sure. Many whales have hair, just like land mammals. In this photograph, you can actually see the whiskers of this baby gray whale as he rests his chin on mama's back. Strangely, whales have arm, wrist, hand, and finger bones inside their front flippers. Here's a photo of these bones, the same bones that bats, hippos, and people have in their front appendages. One bone, two bones, wrist, hand, and finger bones. Modern whales do not have back legs, but they do have a strange pair of bones where the hind legs should be. Here's a picture of these bones from a bowhead whale. They almost look like shriveled hip, thigh, and shin bones. This one even has a ball and socket joint between the hip and thigh bone, just like the ball and socket joint in your own hip. Is this resemblance a mere coincidence, or are these real leg bones? Perhaps leftovers from the whale's evolutionary history. Before we draw any bold conclusions, let's see if a completely separate line of evidence will confirm our suspicions. Embryology is a study of how creatures develop before being born or hatching from an egg. Here we see a dolphin and a human embryo side by side at similar stages of development. Notice that they both have what look like arm buds and leg buds. In humans, the leg buds grow to become legs. In whales, they grow for a while but then stop effectively fading away as the rest of the whale continues to grow. These are all photographs of a common dolphin at different stages of growth. Notice that early on, we see two nostril grooves on the front of the face, just like you'd expect in a puppy or a human. As the dolphin continues to grow, the nostrils migrate to the top of the head and fuse together, becoming the dolphin's blowhole. So far, we have multiple facts from two independent lines of study, comparative anatomy and embryology, that are both telling us the same story. The ancestors of whales were once four-legged land creatures. Will the fossil record act as a third witness, confirming this idea? These are two species of extinct basilosaurid whales. These animals are known for multiple well-preserved skeletons, and they appear to have lived side by side, roughly 34 to 40 million years ago. In this photograph, we're looking down at the top of a basilosaurid skull. This is not a model or a cast. These are the actual bones which were pulled from the ground. Notice that the nasal opening is not on the top of the head like those of modern whales, and not at the end of the snout like those of land mammals. Instead, it's right in the middle. This is an intermediate species, exactly what evolution tells us we should find. At the back end of a basilosaurid's body, there are small, yet fully developed hips, legs, ankle, feet, and toe bones. These legs are far too small for walking on land, but they may have been useful while mating, or for scratching away parasites and itchy skin. Evolutionary theory tells us that the further we go back in time, the harder it should be to distinguish whales from normal land mammals. Meat. Myocetus. The hip bones of Myocetus seem sturdy enough to walk on land, but this animal is considered to be a whale for many reasons. 
Their skeletons have all been found among fossils of sea creatures, which tells us they lived in the ocean. Their short legs, combined with long, flat fingers and toes, suggest they were strong swimmers with webbed hands and feet. Here we see the bottom side of a Myocetus jaw and skull. Her teeth match those of the basilosaurid whales we saw earlier, and the unique structures of her middle ear bones match those of basilosaurid whales and modern whales. Myocetus appears to be a walking whale. Scientists have found the fossils of many ancient whale-like mammals and continue to find more. Together, these fossils blur the line between four-legged land mammals and fully aquatic modern whales, solidifying the idea that whales indeed evolved from land creatures. Now let's look at a fourth line of evidence, DNA. DNA molecules contain chemical codes which act like recipes for living things. Without ever looking at bones, embryos, or anatomy, researchers can compare the DNA code of different living creatures to find out who is most closely related to who. Whale DNA has been compared to all kinds of other animals, fish, sea lions, you name it. And so far, the closest genetic match is to the pudgy, water-loving hippopotamus. This does not mean that whales evolved from hippos, but if this genetic finding is correct, Whales and hippos both evolved from a common ancestor that lived roughly 54 million years ago. At first, the link between whales and hippos surprised researchers because whales are mainly carnivores. They eat things like fish and small crustaceans. Hippos, on the other hand, are mostly vegetarian. A closer look, however, reveals that hippos and whales actually share many strange features, some of which may have come from their common ancestor. Ancient walking whales have specially shaped ankle bones found only in hippos and the close relatives of hippos. Just like whales, hippos are known to give birth and even nurse their young underwater. They both have multi-chambered stomachs, which is common for herbivores, but is almost unheard of for meat-eating mammals. They are both missing a coat of fur, and here's a fun fact. Whales and hippos are among the only mammals on Earth that have internal testicles. So there you have it. Four independent lines of evidence all tell us the exact same story. Whales evolved from four-legged land mammals. But the history of whales is not the only evolutionary history that we've been able to work out. We know from fossils, DNA, embryology, and many other lines of evidence that bird wings are actually modified arms and claws. Birds evolved from dinosaur-like ancestors. We can also clearly see that bat wings evolved from five-fingered hands very similar to those of monkeys and shrews. We found that humans share a fairly recent common ancestor with chimpanzees, hmm. that mammals evolved from reptile-like creatures, those reptile-like creatures evolved from amphibian-like creatures. Those amphibian-like creatures evolved from fish-like creatures. And fish, if you go back far enough, share a common ancestor with segmented worms. So to sum things up, thousands of observable facts from completely independent fields of study have come together to tell us the exact same story. All living things on Earth are related. I'm John Perry, and that's a basic overview of the evidence for evolution stated clearly. So guys, I think we've seen um, evidence backing up our claims, which is what science is all about. So thanks, science, and thank you for staying with us all the way till the end and trying science and get that homework, and I'll see you guys on the next one. Bye for now.